I'm Ben Weingarten. I'm Amber Duke. I'm Delano Squires. And I'm Emma Waters. And this is NatCon Squad, where common good and common sense meet. NatCon Squad is produced by the Edmund Burke Foundation, the home for national conservatism. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, we've got a diverse array of conversations to kick off this week. Emma, we'll start by talking a little bit about open borders, crime, and the nexus to what's going to transpire in the 2024 election. I'll talk a little bit about up, an upcoming hearing that I'll be participating in regarding the censorship industrial complex and some of its implications. After that, Delano will talk about Juneteenth and the concept of race broadly among the American right, the modern right, rather. And last but not least, Amber will take us home by talking about life after Dobbs. So with that, let's kick it off with Emma. Hey, Ben, thank you. So today I'm talking about a topic that I think we've probably all thought of, thought about, we've all read about quite a bit, and that is the increase in illegal immigration and the crime wave that that has really wrought on the American people. So since President Biden took office, we know that more than 9 million illegal immigrants, um, including close to 2 million known getaways, not to mention those that are unknown, have entered the country because of the president's border crisis. Many of these illegal immigrants also have a very long, um, lengthy track record of criminal convictions, including homicide, domestic abuse, sexual assault, um, robbery, the list goes on and on. And something that I think is really interesting to point out is that when we're actually looking at the previous arrest record, in many cases, we're actually looking at just their arrest record in the United States, not even to mention, mm -hmm. not mentioning what that was prior to coming to the United States from their country of origin. Um, and so as we're heading into the election, of course, this issue of the open southern border, um, the issue of illegal immigration and crime are some of the biggest issues that the candidates are focusing on. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time looking at the latest case um, of two illegal immigrants um, from Ecuador who, or sorry, from Venezuela, who uh, very recently had uh, engaged with a young teenager, um, lured her under a bridge before tying her up, allegedly abusing her and then murdering her and leaving her body there. Um, they're actually in court today and tomorrow, setting the bond and preparing uh, prosecution. So the very first uh, illegal, illegal immigrant actually had uh, his bail set at $10 million, and they're expecting a similar fee for the other individual. Should they be convicted? Convicted, the death penalty is on the table. Um, and this is something that's getting wide coverage across the United States because it is yet one of many cases of illegal immigrants targeting American citizens, um, in many cases, young women, and really it, it just like, yeah, doing some of the most horrible things but from sexual assault to murder itself. Um, yeah, and so that's something that I've been thinking a lot about, especially as it relates to uh, one, the bad policies that we have in place from catch and release uh, to the Biden administration's just like willing destruction of any like reasonable um, border policies, but two, how this is going to actually impact the election itself. Um, so all of these deaths are preventable in the sense that if you have a strong border, if you have strong border protections, then these illegal immigrants would not be in the country, right? They would have been returned the first time. They would not have been released to begin with as many of them were. Um, and we would see the American people and their lives actually prioritize. And that's just not happened with this current administration. And particularly, it's, it's really been a war um, that's taken its toll on the most vulnerable in society, particularly young girls and women. Um, so you have the case of Jocelyn uh, Nuraway, who's the one who's in court right now. You have Rachel Morin, the mother of five, um, who was murdered. Uh, this year, you have Lincoln Riley, the Georgia college student who was murdered while on a run, um, and countless others who have suffered from driving incidents or just outright attacks. And so as we're thinking about this issue, I wanted to kick it over to the group um, and first see, like, what do we make of Biden's weak efforts um, now that we're getting close to the election to start to enforce border laws? Um, so we know that Biden's policies have been the thing to directly uh, weaken the southern border and allow for these things to happen. Uh, and yet now, if you Google Biden, 
all of the left-wing media is like, wow, Biden enforces strong protections at the border. He's really saving things now. Um, and this just seems like a weak attempt to try to set himself up going into the election when really his track record uh, doesn't allow for that in a serious sense. Um, obviously, he's used things like the claim that he doesn't have the presidential authority to do this, that he's relying on Congress, and that's played out a few different ways. Um, but if we know that fear and potentially like, uh, yeah, like really fear motivate people to the polls. Do we think that this issue of the open southern border of crime has grown to such an extent in the minds of the American people that it's going to be a driving force in this election? Or is it a really popular right wing talking point that maybe won't actually play out as compared to the other social issues? Um, and yeah, how does this set Trump up? Well, are we losing Hispanic voters? Are we gaining Hispanic voters over this topic? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts on this. One thing I'd say uh, at the outset is there's been recent polling showing that I think 51% of Americans would be supportive of what's been characterized as mass deportation of illegal aliens. And that includes 42% of Democrats. To me, the 42% of Democrats is the mm -hmm. really potentially telling number here. Maybe a number that at the margins could be decisive. We've seen in recent election cycles, immigration usually checks out in terms of most significant issues for voters as a plurality kind of issue. And it's been right up there in the polling in the run up to the 2024 contest with inflation and the economy as an issue. And I guess the question will be in part, to what extent does that correlate with the improving Trump margins among Black and Hispanic voters to the extent movements in those margins are decisive? And then is there anyone who will refuse to vote for Joe Biden because of the immigration invasion policy or where that'll be a disproportionate factor that sways someone who would otherwise vote for Joe Biden away from voting for him? To me, you know, those are a couple issues probably worth interrogating. And then the, the last one, last point I'll make really briefly is and this is beyond the election is there's been evidence to suggest that a declining portion of those coming to our country illegally consists of those from the global South. And increasingly, you have not just Chinese nationals, but also nationals from African nations and Middle Eastern nations, some substantial portion of whom are coming from countries that have disproportionate jihadist problems. That ultimately also may become a major national issue. It hasn't gotten a lot of airtime yet, but there have been a couple notable incidents, uh, including near U.S. military installations that raise jihadism related concerns there and national security concerns more broadly as well. I think it's important to point out as well that with a lot of these so-called solutions that the Biden administration is pushing and the Democrats are pushing, they wouldn't have stopped these individuals. Um, I mean, first of all, Rachel Morin's killer obviously snuck across the border illegally and had been deported two times previously, according to some reports. Um, there's no uh, uh, sense that a, a change to a minor change to asylum policy would have prevented her killer from getting here. And then they keep talking about how we need more border patrol agents or we need more immigration judges to process cases faster. Well, the killer of Jocelyn Nungare, the alleged killer of that 12 year old and uh, Kayla Hamilton's murderer were both processed at the southern border before being released into the interior of the United States. So if you're not actually changing what you do with individuals who are processed and you're still just releasing them with a future court date or giving them some kind of parole status or allowing them to check in on the CBP-1 app, then you're not actually changing the pool factors for why criminal illegal aliens are coming here in the first place. And so it's all just a complete ruse. You know, one of the things that strikes me is um, how the left tries to deflect away from this issue. And they'll say, they'll say, uh, you know, uh, uh, illegal aliens are 37 percent less likely to commit crimes than, than um, citizens. And to that, I'm thinking, OK, I, I may get frustrated if, you know, one of my kids steals my wallet, but I have a completely different perspective on it if it's a home invader. Right. Because the person who comes into my home illegally is not supposed to be there. And, and I think we can both state that clearly without um, giving, making the argument or implying that 
the the majority of people who come to this to this country are are criminals. I don't I don't think we have to to go there, but I don't see why the left finds it necessary to deflect away from actual. I'm talking about violent um, felons who who engage in the most types of, the most sadistic types of behavior. So um, I think at a certain point, you know, they are to Ben's point are going to have to acknowledge the problem that this creates. For me, the bigger question is. Um, what does uh, an America first immigration policy look like practically? Because when I think of any, when I think of public policy and I'm doing public policy analysis in my head, I think of five eyes. I think of intent. I think of incentives. I think of interest. I think of implementation. And then I think of impact. The implementation piece, like I, I know mass deportation sounds good, you know, on TV, but I want to know what that actually looks like. Uh, whether in the Trump administration or some other conservative administration in the future. Yeah, and if I can jump off of that, Delano, because I think that's a, a really important point about the deflection that the left uses um, to say that, um, well, their crime rates are lower. Um, well, again, they shouldn't be here in the first place. And then even then, the statistics don't actually delineate most of the time between legal and illegal immigrants. And the mm. only state that even tracks illegal immigrant crime data is Texas. And even then, their data is relatively new. Um, the Center for Immigration Studies did a breakdown of that data where they found that there was a lot of undercounting that was taking place because people don't always have their immigration status checked when they're first booked into jail. So if you follow them throughout the legal process, and maybe their immigration status is found out later, either while they're still going through the criminal adjudication process or even after they leave custody, they determine that the violent crime rate for illegal immigrants is actually higher than native born Americans. Mm. And there's an ongoing battle between Cato and uh, CIS about um, whether the data was actually undercounted or not. Um, but I think that's important too, because it's a, it's a secondary way of, of course, debunking that very popular talking point. I, I would just underscore the crime wouldn't happen if illegal aliens weren't here. That that has to be the starting point of the conversation. But I think the reality is that what Democrats are saying, and I don't know why Republicans don't frame it this way, except for the fact that Republicans are Republicans, is that Democrats are willing to have increased crime, societal breakdown, all manner of problems associated with assimilation, and not to mention, of course, the costs, even though uh, to your point, Amber, some will say, well, you know, illegal aliens contribute X, Y, Z to the GDP. But then you look at the costs and actually, you know, we end up subsidizing them as American citizens, I would argue. And I think the studies show. But at the end of the day, Democrats are willing to say we're, we we constrain the budget. We constrain civil society. We can allow for increased crime. That is just the price we pay for being a just country and ensuring global mm -hmm. equity. And, and, and I think that they need to be put on the spot. With that simple argument, are you willing to let Americans die? Are you willing to let fentanyl deaths skyrocket, et cetera, in service of your view that borders don't matter and we are a global nation, not a nation? And it seems that they've answered that question at this point, right? Like we, we've uh, been faced with the data many, many times at this point. We know what's happening and the continual push for these same policies that have created all of those same outcomes seems like a clear uh, answer to your question. Well, on that note, I will uh, use my, I guess, executive prerogative here to transition to my topic, which is censorship industrial complex and a hearing that I'll be participating in tomorrow, uh, the Wednesday after we're recording this podcast before the small business committee in the house on effectively government funded censorship through funding vehicles that aim to discredit and get defunded through killing advertising revenue streams of small, independent, sometimes conservative, but also dissident outlets on the left. Uh, these entities being funded by, based upon what the Small Business Committee is probing, the State Department's Global Engagement Center, which is supposed to be, which was created to counter foreign propaganda but has funded the likes of NewsGuard, the Global Disinformation Index, and others that basically engage in what some have called censorship by risk rating, where they will grade your site on subjective standards. And in the case of NewsGuard, it's journalists grading the work of other journalists and a subset of their work to then brand 
an entire outlet, either nutritious or not nutritious, in its words, on a hundred point scale. And we've seen in practice that generally the conservative sites get branded with low scores and they're uh, they're basically treated as major purveyors of misdis and malinformation. And then the corporate media sources and left wing media sources get glowing scores and ratings. And there seems to be a correlation between advertisers who take these blacklists that are created by these entities and choose on behalf of the brands that are their clients to place ads or not place ads based on these blacklists, mm -hmm. that the end result is the conservative sources and small and independent media sources have dramatic declines in ad revenue. And of course, their competitors are the beneficiaries of it. So that's the focus of this hearing. There's an increasing oversight push in the House more broadly, the likes of the Foreign Affairs Committee and now also the House Oversight Committee are probing the work of these government-funded entities. I would say this is you know, part and parcel of the censorship industrial complex itself, going after conservative and small and independent voices, dissident voices, mm -hmm. anti-establishment voices via targeting media companies is just as much of an effort to abridge American speech with our tax dollars as the other means and vehicles for targeting speech, including through targeting uh, the social media companies and all manner of wrong think and wrong thinkers that have been targeted there. To my mind, a, a couple observations or implications of this that I think are notable is you have House committees just now engaging in subpoenaing these entities. And this is a backward looking exercise, which is one of the frustrating things. We're litigating now literally and then sort of figuratively issues that have cropped up over the last six years in some instances and seven years and beyond and a censorship industrial complex that really started after Trump won, which I think tells you everything you need to know about what the censorship industrial complex is really about. But these are backward looking exercises while there may be new means and vehicles for engaging in essentially suppressing dissent in this country as we go into the 2024 election. We may see it. We've had we talked about cheap fakes, or I believe we've talked about cheap fakes before that the administration has raised. Uh, I think that is a predicate for trying to suppress even more wrong think, maybe on immigration, maybe in the run up to the 2024 presidential election. We'll have to see. Uh, but I guess what I'd raise for the group are, you know, do you kind of share the same demoralized perspective that I do that these are backward looking exercises. And what do you see potentially percolating on the horizon in 2024 that's going to lead to effectively election interference through new means of suppressing dissident voices in the run up to the elections? And I'd love to hear a little more from you um, while maybe others are answering or thinking, answering, um, what are the specific topics that they've targeted most recently? Obviously, COVID misinformation from 2020 yeah. and 2022 makes a lot of sense. And then I imagine these like ultra white right wing, very scary um, outlets that are being uh, suppressed or likely very normal outlets that many of us write or speak at. Um, so do, do we have examples of like who's like actively being targeted or is this just, yeah, are we still digging into that at this point? So uh, obviously, you know, the original kind of predicates for the censorship industrial complex were some kind of nexus of Russian mis and malinformation, foreign mis and malinformation to U.S. speech, and then sort of, a, as Mike Benz has called it, a foreign to domestic switcheroo, where then they target Americans who engage in wrong things, and they don't care about the attribution, which is obviously a big problem in and of itself. So... The Hunter Biden laptop story was sort of the start of this, at least evident to the public. And then there was, of course, all things related to COVID-19 pandemic, as well as election integrity issues in 2020. We'll see if election integrity is an issue in 2024 as well. But we do know that there have, have been at least one state, Pennsylvania, which has a task force that's, that's set up in conjunction with some of the same federal players that helped inflate the censorship industrial complex to target mis dis and malinformation around elections. Beyond that, there's evidence that's been unearthed of federal agencies talking about a slew of other issues where there might be a nexus to the censorship regime. 
Definitely, we've seen in terms of uh, dissident views on the war in Ukraine, they're cast as potential Russian misinformation. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly been used as a predicate. There's been talk about uh, financial misinformation potentially being a target. Also, immigration that has come up in government documents as an issue, irregular immigration, uh, they call it there. Haven't necessarily seen it on issues like climate and gender, but you can imagine that the entire panoply of issues, if they can argue that there is some nexus to domestic violent extremism or even just domestic extremism, that will be used as a predicate to say government has an interest in working with others in a whole of society collaboration to suppress that speech. So, so one of the things that I'm interested in is, um, and I feel like we're, we're in this space on a lot of issues, right? Where um, I think very few people are actually free speech absolutists. So then the question is, where is the line drawn? And I would be curious to know, particularly on the right, for instance, would we draw the line at Alex Jones? Would we draw it at Nick Fuentes, right? Do we think that there is a space for some type of demonetization, some type of censorship, some type of platform management or are we comfortable with sort of, you know, the Wild West and let everyone let everyone have their peace, even if they say, you know, vile and, and disgusting things? Um, and, and how we draw that particular line. It's easy for us to say, obviously, the, the, the COVID shenanigans and the Hunter Biden laptop stuff. But then at what point do we say, OK, we do think that there should be some regulation in this space? And, and I'm curious to hear more about that. Yeah, I'm happy to let everyone else. Yeah, I'll let everyone else jump in, but just say, you know, to, to your point, Delano, um, some of some of what's been censored is clearly it's beyond the pale that it's censored because you're talking about protected political speech. And more importantly, when it's government authority is doing it, that to me is a problem. But I definitely think there's room for a conversation about what should be abided and what shouldn't be abided, and that many would argue that the founders themselves were definitely not free speech absolutists. But with that, I'll see the floor. Yeah, I, I, getting into the government portion of this, I mean, aside from the fact that the DHS and other government agencies were creating disinformation boards with the intent of pressuring social media companies to censor information, there's also, of course, the more insidious way they do this, which is with funding NGOs with government grants that then take on that task for them. And it's really mm. just a convenient sort of slippery way for them to get around uh courts uh, chiding them for their behavior as has been done against the Biden administration and as is uh, being looked at by the Supreme Court in Murthy v. Missouri, which I think we might hear on this week. Um, but there, yeah, there's, I mean, there's so much documented evidence of them using these uh, nonprofits and supposedly nonpartisan groups to do their bidding. And so many of the misinformation, disinformation groups are just uh, aggressively left leaning because they're the only ones that use that term to mean it in the way that we're talking about it. Um, mm. You don't see conservative groups popping up for the purpose of censoring their political opponents. Um, and I think this even goes back to places like Media Matters, right, that um, didn't uh, accuse people maybe necessarily of spreading disinformation, but of uh, spreading hate and bigotry. And so that was a good enough reason for them to go after their advertisers and try to um, push cancellation campaigns to get people taken off of the air. And uh, it was sort of an inevitability. I think that this ended up becoming a tool of the faceless bureaucrats in government um, to take those tactics and wield them against the U.S. citizenry. And especially because we know words like Christian, white male, patriot, uh, things that are just like part of being like a good, normal citizen are now uh, all the buzzwords that are being searched for, for government censorship um, or worse things, right? Like this is just deeply concerning. These are just normal words that normal Americans use and associate with, yeah, being an upright citizen in person. Um, so if this is the level that they're stooping to, this is going, uh, yeah, it's just a very scary place. I think where many normal Americans will find themselves getting looped into what they, I think would probably have just thought that that's like, a, a distant problem for some someone else to deal with and searching their bank accounts mm. yeah the censorship industrial complex is the pr the precursor to the social credit system with american characteristics mm. that is, is definitely already starting to be imposed um, on that not sunny note uh let's transition now to delano to talk about 
Juneteenth and the modern rights approach to race? Sure. So uh, as everyone knows, last Wednesday was June 19th or, or Juneteenth, which is now a federal holiday, but for decades has been a holiday in the state of Texas. It commemorates the end of slavery in Texas on June 19th, 1865. Um, and that was the day that uh, General Gordon Granger issued General Order Number 3 and freed all remaining slaves in the state over two years after President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. So um, again, th there's a sort of a deep history of, in terms of celebrating Juneteenth on a local or state level. I mean, it's a fairly, very significant um, event in Texas history. That, that state holiday was elevated to a federal holiday in 2021 by President Biden, but um, President Trump pledged to make it a federal holiday when he ran for president in 2020. And I think since then it has been um, subject to all of what we've come to expect from identitarian sort of politics on a national scale. Um, I think there are people on, on the left who sort of uh, hold to Juneteenth according to its original origins. There, I think there are also people on the left who believe that uh, America is um, was, has been, and forever will be sort of systemically and endemically racist. And because of that, we need a new founding, a new founding date. We need a new flag. We need a new anthem. Um, and to them, Juneteenth, for some of them, I think, is a replacement for July 4th. Um, but on the flip side, I think there's a growing sentiment on the right. Um, and and my, con my observation on the right is that it at times it seems like conservatives are willing to forego their party of Lincoln credentials and rhetoric um, in favor of being a party of anti-leftism. So last year, 2023, you know, Candace Owens uh, tweeted that Juneteenth is so lame and so ghetto, and uh, Charlie Kirk said it was a CRT-inspired holiday. Um, so it, it's I bring this up because I think this is a actually a bipartisan issue, not Juneteenth. But um, the way our race conversations have sort of devolved, I, I feel, in recent years and largely in part to the ubiquity of social media. Um, and I think what it's created is an era of Pavlov politics that are not characterized by identity, but rather by anti-identity. And that anti-identity is found in, at times, a tenuous unity around um, an opponent as opposed to around specific values. So I'm just interested to see how that continues to unfold on the right, who to this point, I've, I've heard conservatives talk about um, desiring to be colorblind and not generalizing people based on race and, and not engaging in certain types of race rhetoric in the public square. But it seems that there is, um, and I understand why, but there is uh, a growing sort of movement to say no, we should have a more robust sort of ethnic white identitarian sort of political stance in the public sphere, because if everyone else is doing it, we shouldn't be the only people um, whose hands are tied and can't engage in the same way. So it, to me, it, it's, it's interesting. And, and, and last thing I'll say before, you know, kick it to the group. I, I do think part of this is because of, is due to a backlash um, in sort of the identitarian politics most largely seen with sort of the LGBT movement. Um, and I, I think it's possible that um, some of the racial progress can end up being collateral damage. So when the party of Lincoln fights hard in the public square for the preservation of Confederate statues, then a holiday celebrating the end of slavery and uh, a hymn dedicated to Abraham Lincoln, I think it's time to ask certain questions about where we're going as a movement. So I'll, I'll leave it there and kick it open to the group. You know, I think you're right, Delano, that it's certainly, uh, it's basically impossible to separate Juneteenth from a hyper-politicized issue. Um, I oftentimes think like, what if it had happened uh, under Trump or been established under Trump, right? I think you would see a wildly different rhetoric um, around mm -hmm. the issue either the left um, not really promoting the issue or claiming that it's some sort of like Uncle Tom's cabin, like here's like our little bit of bread we're handing you, but it's nowhere near sufficient. Here's all the things he should have done instead. And frankly, I think had Trump established it, 
uh, you wouldn't see the same sort of like prominence the holiday has received since then, um, which isn't to say anything about mm. like the holiday itself, just like the political nature of this debate. Um, I often wonder this with Trump too, right? Like if Trump had remained president, what would the COVID restrictions had looked like? Would getting the jab be like the most conservative thing? Um, and leftists are like, no, we, you know, like you never know how these things could play out because of how weird the political narrative goes. Um, but it really, yeah, so it, it strikes me, though, like with the Juneteenth issue in particular, um, that, yeah, like it just, yeah, like thinking about like Trump's involvement in this, what it would have looked like if he had done it versus President Biden putting it into place. Um, that just seems inescapable. The way the right has responded to it, I think is always really interesting. Um, we tend to joke that, or we joked at least this year, that Juneteenth was like the widest holiday because who are the people who get Juneteenth off? It's like think tanks and federal employees, right? Like if you're mm. actually like working like, a, like a, a job, like an hourly wage job or like some blue collar job, very unlikely you're actually getting this holiday off. Um, so I think on that side of the thing is like the question of like, who who's really benefiting? Is this just like white liberals feeling good about themselves? Themselves, taking the day off, thinking about how they're so just and helping other people when in reality, right, they're just going shopping and making other people work for them on this holiday. Um, is the fact that we have it just an important marker that we should value as a nation, right, even if it doesn't maybe play out in days off or like any change beyond that? Um, you've obviously thought about those aspects more, but it just seems it, it strikes me just sort of as like liberals patting themselves on the back more than like any sort of like substantive like educational opportunity or change for like America broadly. Yeah, I agree, Emma. I, I, it, the establishment of Juneteenth as a federal holiday, we have to remember, was done in the context of cities like Washington, D.C., uh, renaming streets like Black Lives Matter Avenue and Democrats advancing the George Floyd Policing Act. And um, all of that, I think, cannot be separated from what the ultimate motivation was for making it a federal holiday, even if it deserves to be one. Um, and so I, that sparked, I think, a lot of the difficult feelings about it for people on the right. Yeah, I would echo those comments and just add that politics corrupts everything it touches. And it's hard to judge almost any sort of public policy issue like this on the merits, because you have to judge it in the context of the timing, who is behind it, who benefits, to what end. And it's a shame because it's corrosive. Ultimately, the hyper-politicization corrodes civil society. It breaks the bonds and creates unhealthy distrust, but understandable distrust uh, among everyone in society and ultimately redounds to the benefit of none of us. So I, I, I would just look at this as symptomatic, the sort of debates about this, of uh, much broader pathology, that pathology being that politics and especially identity politics have been injected into every aspect of society. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because I mean, the, the people who are against, who were and are against making Juneteenth a federal holiday include not just, you know, some conservatives, but also I'm thinking of, you know, someone who's on the far left, Mark Lamont Hill, professor, social commentator who, you know, gave a speech in a church in Chicago, basically saying, look, as soon as it became a federal holiday, it became commercialized, it became whitewashed, so on and so on and so forth. So I, I think I, I certainly see the benefit of having it as a, as a state holiday. And actually, Washington, D.C. has its own Emancipation Day, um, April 16th, uh, to commemorate the end of slavery. But one of the things that ended up happening, and I, I worked for city government, so I had it off, is that Juneteenth became, after it became a federal holiday, became more of a big deal in D.C., even though it's a Texas holiday than D.C.'s own Emancipation Day. So I, I agree with you, Ben. I think politics corrupts these things. But I, but I will say this. I do think there is there is cause for concern when our politics become defined by who we are against rather than who we are for. Um, and so I've seen how this has played out on the left. If you make whiteness, quote unquote, the enemy, then anything you can shove into that category, including the nuclear family, timeliness, objectivity, merit, rigor, you can you can pitch to quote unquote people of color, black folk, and say, oh, you should um, pro life laws. You should you should be against those things because those are aspects of whiteness. And on the right, anything you can shove into the category of wokeness, you you end up doing the same thing. So I, I just think it's something that we should be mindful of as we move forward.
So on that note, um, why don't we transition to Amber to talk a little bit about life after DOPS? Yeah, sure. So obviously um, this week marks the two-year university uh, or anniversary, jeez, of uh, of Dobbs, which overturned the long-running precedent um, that created a right to abortion of Roe v. Wade. And uh, there's been a very big political shift that I want to get y'all's thoughts on on the left and how they talk about abortion. Um, as we've seen this issue kicked back to the states, um, of course, President Donald Trump is running on the idea that it should stay in the states. He's not interested in a federal ban. The left has responded, well, that means that you own all uh, pro-life restrictions that are passed in states too, including like a six-week ban in Florida. But I think even more insidiously, the left has really moved away from even talking about abortion as um, a birth control method, which is what they were really advocating for when Roe v. Wade was in place, which is that women deserve the choice on when and how to end their pregnancies. And now the new narrative is all about women's health and actually elevating women who wanted pregnancies but for whatever reason, the pregnancy was not viable or they had a fetal abnormality and therefore they need the abortion to uh, save their, protect their own health or save their own life or um, to provide some sort of mercy to the child. And in uh, this new uh, st uh, strategy, we've seen some very dishonest uh, behavior from the left whether it's claiming that uh, women were unable to access miscarriage care in states like Texas, whose law explicitly states that you can do have uh, miscarriage care and use DNCs and um, uh, basically drugs that expel, uh, you know, dead fetal tissue from the, a woman's womb. That's all allowed under Texas law. I think pretty much every state if not all of them, has a definition for abortion codified into state law that is being used in pro-life laws that does not include spontaneous abortion, which is the medical term for a miscarriage. Um, and it's uh, quite craven, but is it effective, um, I think is the bigger question. And it's, a, a, I think, a really smart tactic because people who, of course, are not um, having the the time or the ability to look into the specifics of what the pro-life laws actually say or question the details of some of the people who are coming forward, like the woman whose radio host husband claimed that a doctor wouldn't give them um, a pill to expel a dead fetus because um, they were worried about being prosecuted under the pro-life law. It turns out that he was advocating for something that wasn't in the standard of care for miscarriages. I mean, most people are, aren't going to look into these details. They're going to hear, oh my gosh, a woman uh, was having a miscarriage and, um, and they, you know, forced her to have the baby in her body for four weeks and it's so sad. And then she hemorrhaged and almost died. Um, I think it's, uh, again, a smart strategy for the left, even if it is quite craven and dishonest. Um, so I'm wondering if, what you all think about this very obvious pivot towards this new way of talking about abortion and what kind of impact it's going to have. Because I see specifically in terms of a demographic change, their previous abortion rhetoric was really marketed towards young women who weren't ready to have families or who were engaging in promiscuous lifestyles. The new rhetoric is actually aimed towards women who are married and maybe already have children and have already become mothers. Um, and that's obviously a very powerful voting block. Yeah, uh, you probably won't be surprised that I take the cynical view on this, which is this must be poll tested. And mm. to your point, uh, I think that Democrats must feel they have a lock on and have exploited to the largest extent already that original the cohort that the original messaging pointed towards among women and now if they can peel off even a small percentage of that other cohort and make this the decisive issue for them then that can be decisive in purple districts and ultimately that can be decisive in the presidential race as well it's also I think and and we don't we don't necessarily know yet where this is going to be the case, but there are obviously uh, referenda pushes in states across the country 
um, and pushes certainly among the left to get abortion related issues on the ballot. And this messaging may well be pointed towards uh, further activating those who might already be activated by those referenda as well. So it's clearly an issue that they think is a political winner. Uh, It clearly seems like a growth issue for them to the extent they're changing their rhetoric to try to appeal to uh, and peel off a new cohort. And uh, the flip side of it is what's the conservative, what's the Republican response that's actually going to neutralize it and ultimately turn it back on Democrats? I don't think we've seen it yet to date. And it makes sense because what we know, I think from very consistent data for a long time, is the majority of abortions occur to single women, um, something like 86%, uh, women who aren't married, right? Whether they're in a dating relationship or like truly uh, unattached to someone else. Um, And then about, I guess that would leave about 13, 14% of abortions occur within marriage. So I think it's a really interesting trend that you're highlighting, Amber, because this is definitely targeting the quote unquote minority of abortions um, to potentially make, yeah, for for various reasons, I think that could be considered there. Um, And something that really stands out to me in the messaging from uh, all sides is the emphasis on the woman at the expense of the husband or boyfriend or partner um, that's necessary for the conception of the child to come about to begin with in most cases, right? Um, And so something that's really struck me, and maybe this is my politically incorrect take for the fourth segment, um, this can just be my trend on the show, but I think that by and large, thinking about the pro-life side of things, the pro-life movement, the the feminization of the pro-life movement from the beginning, this constant emphasis on mothers and their babies, mothers and their babies, at the expense of mentioning the father's that are involved in this, the fathers who uh, like necessarily are a part of the child's life and ought to have equal say or ought to have a role in uh, this decision, has I think long term harmed us and led to the situation um, where we know generally from studies that the number one indicator of uh, a woman's decision to have or not have an abortion is her perceived is the perceived support of a partner, male partner, husband or not. And if she's concerned that he may or may not be supportive, um, that that yeah, that he may not follow through, that he maybe doesn't want the child as much as she does. Um, the more times than not, she's going to go through with the abortion. And so I often wonder sort of in relation to what you're saying, Amber, of what it would look like to have really targeted and involved the fathers uh, in the pro-life movement, um, even now, right? Of like, what does it look like to engage them? Um, And if you can win fathers and men over, right, who are willing to stand up for these children and fight for it, then chances are you're going to see a lot more women um, who are choosing life, right? And who are willing to reconsider these situations um, because it's not just a decision that comes down to them, but it's a decision that they make together, right? Uh, Where they have that support and societal encouragement. And that seems like it would be just a really powerful shift in how we've thought about and talked about this issue for a long time. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback on on, uh, Emma's comments. And I I think the foundation for the future of the pro-life movement has to be a pro-marriage movement, right? And I think to, to your point, um, the vast majority of women who seek abortions are, are unmarried, and and I and I understand why, right? because when you are when you are married, man and woman stand together in front of family and friends and, and God and commit to one another. They are not just saying I commit to you for life, but we commit jointly to the fruit of our union. Um, and I remember sort of like it was yesterday when my f- wife um, handed me a black box and she said, "This is a a, a gift for you." And I opened it up and it was a positive pregnancy test. Now, typically, if somebody handed me a stick that they peed on, I would say, no, thank you. I'm not re- particularly interested. But in that moment, I, I thought this is our child. Um, and, and you have that feeling when husband is committed to wife um, for, for a lifetime. But when it's just, oh, you know, we're just in a relationship. It's a situation ship. It's friends with benefits. You, what you get is, oh, it didn't work out, or you know, I'm not really interested in being a dad right now. And I think it's a lot easier to Emma's point for women to say, well, if I don't have support, I'm not going to go through with this. So I think if if we had a, a robust sort of pro marriage, um, pro, yes, pro family, pro natal, but but with marriage as the foundation of family life, uh, I think we would uh, see sort of an organic decline in abortion numbers 
uh, over the course of generations. And certainly I hope that that will be the case. Yeah, and just um, to add a little bit more to the political aspects of this, um, Vice President Kamala Harris went on a sort of pro-abortion tour this week. She had Kate Cox, the woman in Texas, um, whose baby had a fetal abnormality um, that doctors describe as inconsistent with life, which uh, I would definitely check out um, some videos from Live Action and Charlotte Lozer Institute that from doctors that explain um, why their characterization of the fetal abnormality is not accurate. Um, but they had her introduce uh, Kamala Harris in Maryland, and then she went to a separate event in Arizona. Of course, Joe Biden is not on the trail because he is uh, spending the entire week preparing for his debate against Donald Trump. Um, but it, yeah, it's just fascinating how they've managed to really change just the entire character of the debate. And uh, it seems like the pro-life movement is kind of now on defense because they're having to explain all of these uh, these medical procedures and standards of care um, that were for a long time completely separate from anything related to pro-choice and abortion. So on that note, uh, we'll transition to final thoughts and I'll kick us off with just a couple of brief comments. Uh, looking ahead this week, probably by the time this podcast comes out, we'll have at least some additional opinions from the Supreme Court. Supposedly, there may be opinions Wednesday, Thursday and Friday of this week. Uh, I think there are around 20 or so maybe cases outstanding. It's unclear if the court is going to turn through all of them before the end of the month or not. But the addition of a third day where rulings will come out this week is notable. Uh, on my radar, of course, are Murphy v. Missouri, the sort of most prominent censorship industrial complex case. They're also the related net choice decisions, as well as the January 6th obstruction of an official proceeding case and the executive privilege case as well, among many others. Uh, I will add the caveat that while I will be waiting with bated breath for all of these opinions, as I'm sure some of you may be as well, on the other hand, it's a sad commentary that we are waiting for these rulings to be handed down from on high rather than that they are dealt with in civil society or through the legislative branch, that everything gets kicked. The most consequential, substantial, significant issues all end up at the Supreme Court uh, is a devastating commentary, I think, on mm. the legislative branch and also the extent to which our system has devolved into something that does not resemble the republic that was originally created. Uh, beyond that, I'm curious to hear if anyone has thoughts, uh, a preview on what they're expecting from this debate. I think it's probably the conventional wisdom, but this will be a three on one affair and it'll be fascinating to see what strategy and tactics Donald Trump takes in an entirely hostile venue where uh, he's not only going against a president who is going to get all manner of benefits from the moderators who are going to have the ability to cut microphones, but also they are going to be not only probably supporting Biden, but framing every single issue and picking topics in a way that represent the CNN worldview. So hmm. it'd be fascinating to see. And then we'll see in kind of the postmortem analysis, whether the uh, sort of cost benefit analysis that probably went into, okay, is it worth debating him, even if it's the worst possible venue uh, be it's not debating. We'll see if that ultimately shakes out. And then also, you know, if Biden fails and collapses during this debate, if that leads to ultimately Operation Jettison Joe Biden from the top of the ticket as well. It was, yeah. uh, go ahead, Emma. Oh, God. I was just gonna say, like many people have expressed, my concern is that the bar is set low, so low, even in the minds of the American people that uh, just a coherent, if not particularly impressive um, performance by President Biden will be enough to reassure the base. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really, really big uh, gamble, I think, if he has a bad moment, uh, then that's the only thing that we have to talk about. And that that goes a long way. But otherwise, 
I'm holding my breath. We'll see how it goes. Um, I do think uh, addition to this uh, flagging the selective service that's ha being voted on in the house, the inclusion of women in the selective service for the first time in particular. Um, this is something Phil Schlafly and others have talked a lot about um, and extending those privileges to women um, such that they're not required to be on the list to go fight in foreign battles. Uh, so just re-upping that in the minds of listeners, um, that that's still an ongoing fight to ensure that women aren't included in the selective service and later even in the draft. Yeah, we saw a, an interview moment this week where Caroline Lovett, who's a spokesperson for the Trump campaign, was trying to provide some examples of moderator Jake Tapper's historical bias against conservatives. And the host, Casey Hunt, of the show she was on, cut off her microphone and ended the interview, um, which I think is probably a preview of what we can expect if Trump calls out any of the moderator bias at the debate. He's definitely going to be battling them as much as, if not more, than Joe Biden. Um, and then a uh, final point on, on expectations for Joe Biden, he's had, uh, he'll have a week and a half almost uh, to rest before this debate. And if we know anything about um, the potential to change a sleep schedule um, to, to get him sort of in the right state of mind for this, I mean, it, I think it's probably the case that they are adjusting his sleep schedule so that he's at his peak um, at this nine o'clock debate time, as opposed to waking up early. He's probably waking up later in the day. That's why he's not doing public events right now. He's just been releasing uh, written statements. And uh, I, I've been meaning to go back and look at what Trump's comparable debate prep was when he was president. Um, but I suspect that it was not anything close to um, seven or eight days with no public events from the White House beforehand. Hmm. I'm sure they have uh, B12 shots and uh, mango slices on 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 hand for the for the president, so he can stay alert and stay awake. Um, I mean, my my final thoughts actually are, you know, as we close June, um, obviously June has not just been the unofficial start or the official start of summer, but for the last uh, better part of a decade, you know, inundated with Pride Month uh, merchandise, rhetoric, corporate logos, the whole nine, and I. Earlier on Twitter, I saw at least four different tweets from four different news outlets in Texas bemoaning the fact that the Texas Rangers are the only baseball team does not, that does not have a pride night. Um, and, and what it made me think of is actually um, sort of my first century entry into sort of the national conservative scene, which is after going to NatCon in 2022, writing a piece for the American conservative saying that um, to David French saying that, no, actually, drag queen conservatism is the real threat to religious liberty. Um, and I think the people who don't understand what, what, what time it is, who don't see how the government already has picked its favored uh, religion, where every co corporation, every school, every you know, local government agency, every federal government agency, um, you know, has to bend the knee and salute the flag and give a pinch of incense uh, to the to the gods of sexual orientation and gender identity. So it, it's just so interesting. It's one of those things where, again, um, people have no problem pushing a certain worldview and pushing a certain set of beliefs onto the culture um, as long as they align with their political uh, paradigm and political realities. On that note, on behalf of Amber, Emma, and Duano, thanks for tuning in. I'm Ben Weingarten. We'll see you at the next NatCon Squad.